I am so ready for this series. We're starting a brand new series this weekend called Shepherd. And there are just some series that, honestly, I look forward to more than others. And I begin to think about them while I'm preaching the last series. I want to preach them so bad. And now, I mean, Taboo was one of the most well-received and helpful series that we have ever preached. Did you guys get a lot out of that last series? Did you enjoy that? And that was uh, speaking to a lot of people, but I was starting to look ahead just a little bit for this one. Because a few months ago, as a part of his schoolwork, my son Hayes, who's my eight-year-old, he had to memorize Psalm 23. And so I got to hear a lot of Psalm 23. He would quote it at the breakfast table. He would quote it at the dinner table. He would say it all the time because he was so proud of himself. He did such a good job of memorizing it. And as I was hearing that Psalm 23 over and over again, it reminded me of how incredible this psalm is. Uh, so, so packed full of amazing wisdom. It's packed full of realness. It's packed full of stuff that we can use. In fact, you'll see this over the next seven weeks. We're going to take seven weeks to look at Psalm 23. And we're going to see that it is a passage that is chalked full of so much that we can learn from. And so I thought, honestly, that if my eight-year-old can memorize it, what if we all memorized it as well? And so over the next seven weeks, that's what I want us to do, that we're going to drop on social media as soon as the services are over today, a uh, background for your iPhone or your Android device or whatever phone you have, except for flip phones. We can't help you with that one. Can't, can't get you a background for that one. But we're going to give you a background, and you're going to put it on your phone. I want you to take a picture of it, save it, put it on your phone. And here's what happens is statistics say that we look at our phone like 70 times a day. So every time you look at it, just read the verse through, start to memorize it a little bit. And we're going to read it together every single weekend. And hopefully by about midway through this thing, we'll be able to just say it and quote it together. But let's read it today, today together. In fact, let's all read it together. We'll put it up on the side screens for you. It's going to be in the New King James Version of the Bible because a lot of us memorized it in King James when we were younger. And so this will kind of be familiar to us. Psalm 23, starting with verse 1. Let's read it together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down. Sometimes when we read together, our lips move. I don't know if you guys know that or not. All right, so we can start over. Verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your, my, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's so much to learn in that. As we were reading each and every verse, I just want to jump in and preach the words. I want to jump in and tell you what David's saying and why he's saying it. It's an amazing psalm. And psalms are like poems. They're like lyrics to a song. I mean, think if you were writing and you were writing a song for your favorite country music, maybe, or you were writing a song for your favorite kind of hip-hop music, if that's your flow. If you're writing just lyrics down on a page that meant so much to you, that were just incredible to you, and it's an incredible song that David writes. In fact, he writes this song while he is in Mahanaim, and he was in Mahanaim because he had run away from his son Absalom and his son's army who were coming after him, and his Absalom is trying to take the kingship from his father, and so imagine that your son has turned on you. It's a dark hour, a dark time in David's life. He goes away and asks another king if he can kind of hide out in his land for just a little while. He gets his forces and they're fighting and he's there. And it's in Mahanaim that he writes this song, this grief-stricken, this heartbroken, this Taylor Swift-like revenge-type song that he writes. And it was one of the darkest hours of his life. And this is where he pins, though, the beautiful words, the words that maybe you've heard before 
If you've been involved in church at all, I know you have. If you've been on the outskirts of church, you probably have even seen this verse before. Is when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. How many of you know that sometimes we just got to get to that place we got to get to that place in our life where we're walking through a dark time. we got to get to that place when people have turned on us that we didn't expect to turn on us. we got to get in that place when things aren't going right for us. we got to get in that place where we can just say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And next weekend, we're going to look at how does somebody say that? What do they mean by that? What does it mean for God to be my shepherd? But what I see in this is a man who realizes that God will not always calm the storm, but God will comfort us as we walk through the storm. And see, some of you are going through some stuff right now. Some of you are walking through some valleys. You're walking through some hard, dark moments in your life. And what you're wondering is, when am I going to get to the end of this storm? And maybe what you've been praying is, God, will you take away this storm? But David shows us that even in the midst of the storm, in the very moment where he's fighting against his son who's trying to take power from him, that David realizes, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I wonder how many people have been comforted over the thousands of years since David wrote this lyric by this song. I would imagine it's been one of the most widely read lyrics ever. It's been one of those lyrics that people have leaned on, that in times of trouble they've said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, just like we just sang. We've even written songs about this song. This song has given comfort to so many people. But as I look at this, I have to ask myself, what held David up to where he eventually got to write more of this lyric and where he got to eventually write more songs and where he got back into his seat of leadership, where he pushed down his son's rebellion and pushed down his son's army and sat in the rightful place of king again. I look at it and I go, how did he get there to where he's there? And I think we see it in verse 5. Now, we're going to look at verse 5 in total in, in, in week 6 of this series. We're going to unpack verse 5 a lot in week 6, but I think we see something in verse 5 that will give us, a, by way of introduction, this, this understanding of how you get to a place like David got to, places that we don't get to very often, where we continue to walk through the valley, where we can get to the other side of the value, valley, where we, we can have no fear of evil. How did he get there? And what I think we see is that David, what we have to understand about David is that to be able to get to the end of this psalm, to, to be able to continue on like he did, to, to be able to say, I am in the grip of my shepherd and he's a good shepherd while he was going through the storm. He didn't write this at the end as a thank you to God. He wrote this at the beginning as a prayer of belief to God, of expectation to God. Let me ask you, do you come in here with expectation? Do you believe that God can do something in your life? Have you been praying expectantly, asking expectantly? Because that's what David did. He said, God, I expect you to do this. How did he do it? Well, I believe it tells us in verse 5, in fact, the second half of verse 5. So Psalm 23b says, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. So I was reading this all familiar passage again and studying over the last few weeks, I read that and the word that jumped out to me was anoint. Because you may remember if you were here that this month at First Wednesday, we talked about the anointing. And this word anointing and the anointing and what does it mean to be anointed has been something that's been on my mind recently. And if you haven't caught that, I would encourage you to do so. You can go to freedomchurch.sc and you can watch all of our past sermons, but you can watch our first Wednesdays as well. And this idea of anointing is something that's been on my mind. I've been processing. I've been praying about what does it mean to have it? How do you get it? What, what, what happens when you have it? How can you, can, can you not use the anointing when you have it? 
And the anointing, in case that's a big Bible word to you and you go, well, I've heard that word, but what is it? The anointing is the very presence of God in our lives, running down over us, filling every part of us. And in the Old Testament, there was this anointing, as David even says, of oil to symbolize the fact that God had separated him, had called him out, and they would pour the oil over him, and it was a symbol of God's presence and God's power in his life, and we see that in David. But in the New Testament, the Bible teaches us that the anointing has changed just a little bit. In the Old Testament, it was given for such a time as this. It was given to maybe one man to lead. It was given in a circumstance to lead. But in the New Testament, we see that we have a different access to the anointing. In fact, the New Testament teaches us now that the anointing is inside of us inside of us, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2.27 says, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you. Say, in me. It's in you. There's something inside of you. I know you feel like sometimes you're not enough. Sometimes you may even feel like you're too much. Sometimes you feel like you don't have it all together. But if you've asked Jesus to save you, you have a power that is inside of you. In fact, the Bible tells us the same power lives inside of us that raised Jesus from the dead. Think about that just for a moment. When you're walking through all of your valleys, when you're walking through your problems, think about the fact that you have access to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. It's in you. It's in us. And so before we go into our valley, and we will go into the valley with David, and we'll see what it's like to be in the valley in the shadow of death, and we'll see what it's like to fear no evil in those moments before we do that, before you walk through maybe your valley for you is the trial you're going through in your marriage right now. And maybe for you, you're going through a parenting moment that's been a season, and you don't know what you're going to do about the fact that your kids aren't responding anymore, that they've walked away from God. Maybe they're even your adult children and you're going, I don't know what, this is a valley I'm in right now. Before you walk through the valley of the financial crisis, before you get through that, before you deal with that, and you'll try to deal with it on your own, but you won't be able to. But before you walk through those valleys, you gotta know something. Before it tells us that he lays us down in green pastures, And then we're going to talk about that, what it means to be in green pastures, what it feels like to be led by a shepherd to green pastures and still waters. How many of you would like to be around some still waters every now and then instead of all the waters that are rippled up all around you, the rapids that are always around you, your life feels like you're going down a rapid all the time, but you just like to just to be around some still waters for a moment before you can get around the still waters and the green pastures, before you can find out what it's like to live with no fear of the evil all around. Y'all fear no evil, David says. Before all of that can come, you need to understand what made David, what, 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 was, what was in David, what allowed David to get to the end of all of this, what allowed him to, to walk through that. You've got to understand that it was his anointing, his anointing. See, let me ask you this question, and this is the question. I want to deal with this question this whole weekend. It's a single question. I want you to to let it really process inside of you. I don't want you to let it bounce off of you like you do a lot of things I say. I want you to write it down and take a note of it. I want you to think about it, is what is in you? Because you will find out what is in you when you're in the valley between the mountains of problems that are beginning to close in on you. That's when you find out what's in you. This side didn't like that. I'm going to go over here. So I'm going to tell you again. You'll find out what's in you when you're in the valley, but the mountains begin to press of problems all around you. What will come out of you is what is in you. You'll find out who you really are during those times. This side learned. It's when we find out what's in us. It's when we find out what's really going on with us. But see, because here's the thing. I can be a great, in fact, I am a great, great 
husband. I really am. <laughs> Except in those moments when I begin to be pressed and some stuff comes out of me that I wasn't expecting. I mean, I, I'm a lot of the times really good at, at, at responding, at, at listening, at, at, at doing the things that I need to do and doing the things I say I will do. Sometimes like that. But then there's other times when I'm not. I'm not. See, I, I really am. I'm a rock star dad. But like, I am a great dad when everything is going well and everything is happening just like it's supposed to be happening and, and all that. But then I find that there are moments when Connie leaves for an extended amount of time, like maybe this weekend when she went to Charlotte and I have the kids for the whole time, and I have to do what she always does, and I have to do what I always do, and she does a lot more, but I still have to do both of them together, and I'm not very good sometimes at doing what I'm supposed to do, and so when I add what she always does to that, it gets a little bit hairy, and then all of a sudden, I find myself kind of looking at the kids and being exasperated sometimes and, and being kind of overwhelmed sometimes, except for you, Isabel. I mean, you're awesome. You're the best. Like, I never think that about you. And I find myself even thinking, like, I don't have 99 problems, God. I just got four. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm worn out and what comes out of me, I'm not proud of. And it's in those moments where... The littlest girl who just never stops talking, like never, never stops talking. God, I pray for her husband that he likes to listen because <laughs> she just talks all the time. She talks to hear herself talk, and she just asks questions, and she, she asks for things. And we call her Me Too because if anybody says they want anything, she says, Me Too, and that's just what she says. And so she just talks, and there's times when I just look at her and go, yes, for the 45th time today, that pink skirt is pretty. Yes, yes. There are times when I find myself looking at my son, whom I love so much. He, he's a lot like me. He sees life as a joke. He makes a lot of jokes. He likes to aggravate people. I like to aggravate people. He, he likes to, he likes to kind of make himself known in a room. I like to make myself known in the room. And so, but there are times, but he's also obsessed, obsessed with Minecraft. And any parents in the house that know what Minecraft is, it is called water torture is what Minecraft is. And he's gotten a new book where it teaches you all the hacks of Minecraft. And he's telling me how he builds it all. And there are moments when I'm like, man, that is so awesome, buddy. I love that. That's so great. I can't believe you made that house. I can't believe you can go down in there. Yes, I want to look at that. And then there are times like this weekend where occasionally I might have said something like, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. And my kids are like, why don't you get Minecraft on your phone? And I'm like, because I love myself more than that. And I just said, I don't care. And there's these, these moments where we laugh about it, but we're not who we want to be. And it's in those moments that I realize that I want to say, who was that? Like, what made me say that? Like, how did, I, how did I go that direction where I could look at my son, his little eight-year-old sensitive heart, he's so compassionate, and literally say, I do not care about Minecraft. I don't want to hear about it anymore. Please get out of my face. Like, how do I get there? And I realize it's in those moments that... What comes out of me when I'm in the valley, pressed up against the mountains of the problems that surround me, is what's in me. It's what's in me. We say things like, oh, I mean, I don't know where those words came from. That's just not like me. No, it's exactly like you. It's just you held it back for a long time. I don't know why I did that. That was such a dumb thing to do. Why did I take that? I don't even know why. It's because it's what's in you. And so what we see is that David had something inside of him. There's something that can be inside of us. And we can allow it every single day, God to take his presence and his power and through the Holy Spirit to be in us. Look at what, what Paul says in his second letter to Corinthians. He writes about this and he describes it as a light that is the glory of God living in us. Somebody say in us. It's in us we got to remember that because I think we think of God as far off all the time. We, we think of God as some distant God that we pray to. We think of some God that we worship but we don't know. We think of God as somebody who's not really involved in our everyday life, but he's so involved in our everyday life because if you've asked him to save you, he is in you. He's in you. 
He's filling you. And Paul says this. He says, we now have this light. He describes it as a light shining in our hearts. What is in us comes out of us. When the Holy Spirit of God is in us, he's what comes out of us. And Paul says, it's like a light. It's like, it's like, like a presence of, of God that is walking with you. So, so let me ask you again. What is in you? What's in you? What, what are you putting in to your soul? What are you allowing to, to feed your soul? Paul continues, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our own great power is from God, not from ourselves. I love this description that Paul says of us. He says, we are like broken clay vessels, broken clay jars. It, within ourselves, we are just broken. But when what is in us begins to shine out, that's what people see. So there are also these moments when you say things and you don't know where they came from, but they bless people. There are also these times when you make the phone call at just the right time. And you check in on somebody at just the right time. There are those times when you just feel like I ought to drop by their cubicle or I ought to go by their office or I ought to go by their house and you go at just the right time and God uses you in just the right moment. You go, where did that come from? That is the light of God shining out of you. But the, the thing that I love about this and the key to this is Paul says, until we are willing to be broken, it won't shine out. And so just in the moment where we all were beginning to feel a little bit guilty about our parenting because you two have cursed our Minecraft, it just in the right moment when you two have not been the husband or wife that you thought you should be, it's in that moment that God, like he always is, shows us that even when we are broken, he had a plan for our brokenness. That even when we are broken, he said, that just makes a better place for my light to shine out of you. God is ready to use you even in your brokenness. He says that is his power. You can see the light. And this means, here's what this means. Maybe the pain you went through had a purpose. See, you've always looked at the pain as something that you wished you could have avoided. You've always looked at the pain as something that you, you, you look back on and go, I wish I'd, I'd never gone through that. And God is saying, maybe it had a purpose, and it was to take you to a place where the power and the presence of God could shine through you, and you could be used by him. And your pain maybe had a purpose. Maybe that hurt that came your way, and it it felt like a bulldozer that was just tearing everything down around you, tearing down everything you had built in your life. You were starting over again in your 40s, and you were starting over again in your 50s, and you just didn't, it just felt like everything that you thought you were going to be, everything you thought you would enjoy in life, that it was a bulldozer that cleared out everything. What if it was just the bulldozer that was coming in to make a path into your place of healing? What if that was just the only way God could walk you there? Is he needed to clear some stuff out of your life. He needed to show you some things inside of you. Maybe it's in that moment when you two have lost it with your kids or you two have said some things to your spouse that really what he's showing you is there's still some stuff inside of you that I want to fill those spots, but I can't fill them because you've got junk in there. And I want to take that place, but you're going to have to move some stuff out first. Maybe the valley that you thought was starting to squeeze you, the mountains all around in the valley, you thought you were being squeezed, you thought the problems were just about to squeeze you to death, maybe they were just shaping you. Back to Paul's illustration that we are like clay pots. That clay pot was originally made by being shaped it was, it was originally made by pressure being applied to it. And what comes out of you, yes, is shown by pressure, but also our purpose is molded by the pressure. Our purpose is molded by the pain. You, you're a better person because of the pain you went through if you've responded right. He says, I want to I want to mold you. It's, you're going through the valley and it's starting to press on you. But it's just trying to mold you. Look at what Paul continues. He said, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. 
Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. But I've got to ask a question if you won't ask it. Because I read that and I go, how can you get pressed on every side but not be crushed? How can you be perplexed but not driven to despair? Because I've been perplexed about some things in life before and thought, why did that need to happen? Why did that have to happen that way? I've been there before, but I've also been driven to despair by it. How do you do this? How do you get hunted by enemies, but you never feel alone and you can cry out, my father, God is my shepherd and I shall not want. In the midst of being hunted down by your enemies, you know you're not alone because God's presence is with you. How do you get knocked down, but then get up again? You, you're never going to keep me down. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Y'all flowing with me, kids of the 90s? How do you sing that? Here's how. What's in you? Well, see, what's inside of you is what's going to come out of you when you get knocked down. And it may be despair that comes out of you. You may be crushed and feel abandoned. Or you pick yourself up again and go, no, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm not going to fear any evil. I have no fear with me. I keep walking what is in you. Because what is in you is what spills over when you are pressed. You are being anointed by something. The question is, what is it? See, if you fill yourself with fear, and there may be moments of your life where you just say, I just, I'm just a person who seems to you know, kind of think the worst case scenario. I just, wor- I just worry about my kids because I love them. I mean, I just, every ambulance I see, I just think I got to make sure it's not somebody I love. You know, if I see something going down the road, I just, I just, this is who I am. That's just who I am. But if you fill yourself with fear and you fill yourself with fear and you keep filling yourself with fear, let me tell you what's going to come out when you're pressed. Fear. If you fill yourself with anger, and you're just all the time the victim in every situation, and you're just all the time angry about everything that's going on, and you just walk around angry about your sports teams, angry about your job, angry about your family, angry about your yard, angry about everything. Here's what's going to come out when you get pressed is anger. What's in you? If you fill yourself with bitterness because you can't get over the last hurt that happened to you, You can't forgive somebody and keep walking on if you you stop going to church because somebody at a church hurt you and you're filled with bitterness and then you get bitter about everything else going on in your life and you get bitter about your family and you get bitter about your friends and you got no forgiveness and you carry grudges about everything and you're still mad at the person at work for something they did two years ago and you just got a list of people that you are mad about and you are underlining them in red pen and putting checks beside them and checks beside them because they just keep offending you. You fill yourself with that bitterness and here's what you're going to find. When you're crushed, the bitterness is going to come out. Let the, but let me tell you something. You let the anointing of God flow in you, and guess what will come out? You, you let the anointing of God be what fills you up, and guess what will come out? You let the light be inside of you, and guess what will come out? Look at what Matthew 12 says. Whatever is in your heart determines what you say. You say, I can't believe I said that. It's what was in your heart. You say, I can't believe I said that. I'm pretty proud of it. It's in your heart. Whatever's in your heart is what you say. A good person produces good fruit from the treasury of good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. I mean, do I even need to share with you some of the things that can so easily come out of a man of God or woman of God when the anointing is not flowing on them? You didn't answer me, so I must need to share some of those things with you. Do I even need to remind you of what you called her sitting up here in church, smiling, acting like everything's great? Can I even remind you about the road rage you had this week? 
because it was water on the road. And people know people in low country can't drive when there's water on the road. You got mad. Can I remind you what you said in front of your kids to the person in front of you? Can, can I remind you and just reminisce just a little bit about the lust that you faced this week? And you didn't just face it, you gave into it, and it's easy to think that that's a man's problem, but how about the lust for power? How about the lust to be loved? How about the lust to have the life that someone else has? How about the lust to be the size or have the hair color or be the person somebody else is? See, I don't need to remind you about all that. Ain't nobody got time for that. But here's the good news. We don't have to sit there because what we know is that we can talk about the anointing. And it's simple. Here's what the anointing is. It's the baptism or the anointing of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, it says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we have access to, to be filled with and by and led by the Holy Spirit. We can answer the question of what is in us with the answer of the Holy Spirit when God has come to save us. But here's what's true about all of us is that sometimes just because we have access to something doesn't mean that we let it have authority in our lives. Just because we have access to him, the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean that we've allowed him to fill us. The other thing I know about all of us is for some of us, we've given him authority in our lives. He has filled us. But here's what I know about you. And the reason I know about you is because I know it's true about me. And I am much holier than you are is that we all leak. Like, don't you have days where you're like walking and you're like, I am filled with the Spirit of God. He's speaking through me. I'm a good leader today. I'm a good husband today. I'm a good, I'm a good parent today. I wasn't even good at work today. I mean, I am just walking with God. And then the next morning you're like, where did it all go? Like, what happened to it? Here's what I've learned. We have to renew daily. Renew daily the, the Holy Spirit. Asking God, would you fill me again? Because we leak. We're broken, remember? And the light comes out of us, but when we give the light away, we need to ask again for a fresh filling. And so I think that some of you have been surprised by what comes out of you. I think as we sat and talked, you would say, what's in me I'm ashamed of sometimes. But here's what I also know is the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He wants to fill every single part of you but he won't do it until you ask him to. And he won't do it until you make room for him. And so you're going to have to get rid of some of that anger. You're going you're gonna to have to get rid of some of that fear and worry. You're going to have to get rid of some of that bitterness and unforgiveness and make room for God. And then he will do, listen, more than we could ever. He'll take you through the valleys. He'll let you declare that he's a good shepherd. He'll walk with you through everything. He'll get you through. You won't feel crushed. You won't, be, you won't feel perplexed, but you'll be not overwhelmed. You'll just, God, I can't believe I got through that. But you got to ask him. So here's what I want us to do during our response time is we're going to sing. Then there are some of you here who you just need to ask Jesus to save you. The truth is, is you've been playing church for a long time and you've never said, God, would you save me? The reason you don't have the filling of the Holy Spirit is because he's not in you at all yet. And I would ask you just to go and pray with someone or maybe grab the person you came to church with and say, you know what, that's what I need in my life. You can mark it on your card as well and just say, I've asked Jesus to save me today and we'd love to follow up with you. But I believe that's some of you that are here today. I believe there are others of you here today who you just need a filling of the Holy Spirit. You've never given him complete access to your life. Our encouragers, they're our prayer team. They're going to be on either side of the building here, and you can just go to them. They are a safe place. You can go to them and talk to them. They've been trained to pray with you, and they would love to pray with you for the filling of the Holy Spirit, that he would take every bit of you, that he would fill you up and give you the power and his presence for life. And then there are others of us who you've been filled but you know you've been leaking. You know there's some bitterness that's taken root. You know there's some unforgiveness. You know there's some anger. There's some fear. And you just need to go to the cross and repent. It's a filling of your Holy Spirit.
And then for many of you, some of you have signed up already, but others of you didn't know you were going to do this today, but today is your day. You're going to be baptized. There's the baptism or the immersion in the Holy Spirit, the anointing, but there's also the baptism into the waters. And Jesus said, do this just like he did. And the reason we do it is as an outward symbol of something that's going on on the inside. So I want to ask you today, have you been baptized? It's an outward symbol of what's on the inside. Why don't you with expectation say, God, here's what is on side of me. I'm going to walk in obedience today and I'm going to be baptized. I know about 30 people have already signed up to be baptized this weekend, but there's somebody here who's supposed to be. In fact, when I start praying, here's what I want you to do. If you signed up for baptism, I want you to stand up and head right over to that exit door on this side, and they're ready for you. They're ready to take you to where you need to go. They're, they're going to help you. We've got, and if you didn't sign up, here's what I want you to know. We've got everything you need. We've got shorts. We've got t-shirts. We've got undergarments. We've got hair su supplies that you need to do. Not air supply. If we had them in concert, that'd be awesome. But we have hair supply that you can, you can go back there. You can get all your hair did again. We've got everything you need. The only thing we don't have is your first step. So why don't you take your first step? If once you take that one, there'll be somebody there to help you and get there. Maybe grab the hand of a friend and say, walk with me, and you'll be baptized today. I'm going to pray for us, and as I do, if you've signed up or you're ready to go be baptized, go do that. Then we'll respond together. God, thank you so much for what you're going to do today. God, I thank you for those who are going to be saved today. I thank you for those who are going to be filled with your Holy Spirit today, getting a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for those, God, that are right now contemplating, should I be baptized today? God, take away all of the thoughts that are keeping them in their seats, the ones that have kept them in their seats before. And right now, would you speak through me to them, this is your day. God, would you just whisper into their soul, this is your day. And God, that they would take that first step right now. They'd get up out of their seats and be baptized. God, I thank you for those who are and are taking the steps of obedience. God, we worship you and we celebrate you as we respond in Jesus' name.